it's it's, uh, it's something that I uh, tell my students as well if I, when I, when I teach um, improvisation classes. I tell them to to to, to fish with the you know with the basically in a in a bowl of soup and you and you fish with a big spoon and you, you look at it and oh this is interesting and, and let's 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 use that and that's the that's the basic like the primordial soup of improvisation if you want. Hi Rob, how are you doing today? I'm good. Ni hao ma. <laughs> well, thank you for dialing in all the way from Germany to here, and I am in uh, Vancouver, Canada. And you were actually referred to us by Rachel Hare, who is in the uh, UK. So we're traveling the world, and I'm back to Germany again, because uh, I yeah. had a, a guest, Babette, who was one of my first. So it's very excited to be back in Germany. And uh, tell us about your musical journey, and how do you start on music? and why do you end up with the harp and how? Long story, uh, but it started when I um, learned piano as a child mm. and a very provincial music school, but they had one thing called a jazz and rock workshop. And, and that was like, they, they had a classical branch and a, and a jazz improvisation branch. And I, I opted for that. And, um, there was not nothing much rebellious about it. it. It was more like an impulse that I that I followed because I didn't see myself as part of the the classical music career or, or anything like that. But probably because it started late with the piano. I was nine, and and that's considered late by classical musicians. And uh, so I played piano for a, for a bit. Um, also a church organ. I was an organist for for some time. Um, basically to top up my weekly allowance and then um, at the age of 20 I encountered the harp I cut a long story short it was like an epiphany for me it was really like I, I was uh, meeting for a tea with some fellow students at the time and I saw this Celtic harp standing there much like the one that is behind me um, so I, I asked a what what is that and can I play it and it was possible and I I just played and the next thing they said to me was um Ralph we're going to bed now but you can come again and play another another day because it was really nice you know and so I was I was completely away with the fairies for that for that period for like maybe five or six hours and and that sent a very strong message to me that I wanted to learn this instrument and, and play it and play in it. And, and that it, it's, it sounds a bit esoteric when I tell it, but I think the harp just, you know, decided that I would um, be a candidate. Yeah. The instrument picked you. Maybe, yeah. In some way. Much, much like harps, harps has a have, a, have a tendency to, they find there are right owners and that it might not necessarily be the first one. So it's it's a bit like that. They have a, a life of their own. They do. Yeah. So that's how I came to the harp. And then I've, um, and then I've, I've been playing ever since. That's awesome. So you, you started with the Celtic harp. And I think in your yeah. first album, you played the Celtic harp and there were pieces uh, that you wrote, there were music that you have arranged, traditional music, and then there's also your improvisation in there as well. So I guess you started improvising on the harp pretty early on as well, since you already have that. Uh, that on the album. first day, yes. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I came basically, I, I brought a lot over from the, um, from the jazz piano. I had, a, I don't know, he was probably not the best piano teacher in the world, but he, 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 he taught me some some things, some basic things like all the voicings, chordings, chord patterns, uh, blues, and all these jazz chords that we know and love. And I, I was able to to translate that to the even to the Celtic harp from the from the very beginning. And uh, for me, it was nice because with the piano, I had probably hit a wall, like. You hit a wall and you you think this is it and I can't develop any any further, and and I wasn't really, um, I wasn't motivated enough to to get to the next stage from there because that would have meant 
studying the piano from the very very beginning again and and that wasn't somehow that wasn't my path and um, because it, it's not technically a wall it's a step but but yeah. you have to reach the top of the step to you know climb to, to the next it. one and I, I just didn't see myself doing that with the piano at the time so i picked the harp and i thought okay this is a reduction of the piano i only have seven strings per octave and not 12 and i have to fiddle around with the levers and that was very interesting because it forced me to to get to the basics and to the to the modes to the medieval scales and and to basically an, a more ancient part of of the uh, music history so that was very very interesting for me yeah it's it's amazing how taking away those black keys and just give yourself the seven key all of a sudden changes your perspective because i also started with the piano and i also hit the wall and cannot see myself putting in the work to climb over that wall yes so so we seem to have a, a, a similar history maybe with uh, with developing our thing you know yeah it's could entirely be. possible yeah yeah and how old were you when you started Sorry. oh i started to piano when i was probably i'm gonna guess i was about seven years old also late in the grand scheme of things also in the yeah. classical piano realm which uh i'm not a huge fan of to be completely honest <laughs> and i have tiny hands uh, i've actually talked about this with heather uh, which limits my ability to play <laughs> on the piano somewhat especially when you have to you know do the the crazy stretches whereas on the harp thankfully i can fit <laughs> on the harp rather nicely so right. it, in, yeah. in some way it also uh gives me that hope that yeah maybe i can actually do more with this instrument uh whereas the piano i feel like it was a lot more limiting for me yeah yeah well i i mean no i'm a, i'm a, one of those big nose people so i have like like uh paws that were created for moving a lot of soil at the time <laughs> so that was good for the piano and for for the organ but for the harp you're, you're perfectly right you don't need you don't you didn't even need a pinky yeah. you, uh, you're perfectly fine with, with four fingers and, and I, I reserved that one as a like an emergency finger when i run out of fingers and my my fingering is is, is out of whack but uh, yeah, you're, you're right. It's it's perfectly fine for for smaller hands. Yeah, and and it also I I just like the sound of the harp in general. I there is something about the sound of the harp which speaks to me. And speaking of sound, I have seen in one of your earlier videos, um, and I don't know if you still do it. You take it must be a cello bow. I'm gonna guess that you're playing with your left hand while you're plugging the harp on the top with your right hand. How do you come up with that sound combination of having a, a bowl playing on, on the bottom string of your harp and then play melodies on, on the right hand? Where did that come from? I stole it from somebody else. Okay. And <laughs> do, do you enjoy that, that I technique? Stole it, I think I stole it from, our, we, we don't say we steal, we uh, get inspired, I inspired. guess. Inspired. <laughs> yeah, but, but I, I took the idea from my, my dear friend, uh, Sophie Leleu from she lives near paris and there was a time when we met and we we experimented a lot with with some some musical ideas and and i saw her i saw a photo of her in the con conservatory where she studied and she 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 just borrowed a, a violin bow or something or a cello bow and and tried on the harp it's a natural thing to do really when you work with uh, string instruments and or you have a string section in an orchestra and you you are the harp and they are the strings and then and then you, you know you play around and and things start happening um so i think it's a natural thing to do really if you if you um yeah if you met, if you meet um, certain other instruments so that's that's where my idea of using the bow comes from and then i just got one for very little money uh just a very cheap violin bow and and um, I, I added a little um a little piece of cloth on the on the tip to make it uh, to make it less noisy when I when I move it through the strings, mm -hmm. uh, when I when I change from from one note to the other, um, and that's yeah that's how I that's how I use the the bow. It's a, and I I got I, I even got one violin lesson to to like hold the to bow. Learn how to hold the bow. Oh. Yeah, it's because you're supposed to you're not supposed to grab it like that. You, you're supposed to do it all with your wrist and. Uh, it's it's like that kind of movement 
instead of just gra grabbing it and you know like like you do with the pack saw or something it's not the way <laughs> yes well i think that's a good segue to my next question to you and i have to ask it in those exact same words because i like the way you react to it when i asked you this very question the last time how would you describe your musical style and I know you say you don't have a style, but I want you to say it again. And tell us, how do you experiment with your, your art and not be confined with one style? Yeah, and for the first question, I, I, I think I described it with the way I cook when I, when I make a meal. I open the fridge and I see, and I look inside the fridge and, and I see what's there and what's what's left and and what's what needs to go maybe and then um i just cook something out of that so and and um, it's 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 something that i uh, tell my students as well if I, when i when i teach um improvisation classes i tell them to 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 fish with the you know with the basically in a in a bowl of soup and you and you fish with a big spoon and you you look at it and oh this is interesting and and let's 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 use that and that's the that's the basic like the primordial soup of improvisation if you want and that's and how i would how would i describe my musical style um it's Really, a bit of everything. It's it's European music history. I lot. I I used to do a lot of um, organ work in 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 basically Sunday services. So so I I, I do a lot of these uh, choral things. Something like that that you could basically sing a melody to, but there is no melody, or it's improvised and it's it's very ephemeral in a way. Um, I can't really answer your question. It's it's a bit like like George Bernard Shaw said. He said, um, "Never trust an artist who can talk about his work." So I, I really ultimately have to leave it to other people to put a label on it. Yeah. And so later on, I, I think you have added a, a little pedal harp to your harp family and you start playing on the pedal. That's harp, right. Yes, that's that's the big blue thing behind me. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, I thought, OK, coming from the, from the piano, of course, I wanted to to explore that one uh, too, that that option. So I started with the pedal harp about maybe 10, nine, nine or 10 years ago. And just just as an as a field of experimentation, I did some some jazz stuff as well, and and just going back to a more chromatic um, vocabulary. And that was very nice because uh, it's like a it's like the pedal harp for me is like a reference platform. It's it's like a, a test bed, if you want, um, where you can try out ideas, you can compose very nicely, you can um, see how things work out in terms of harmony in terms of adding uh semitones or adding something that would have been a, a lever action but now it's it's a pedal that you can play it's like it's like for trying stuff out i would not consider myself a pedal harpist really because i never really learned the instrument it's it's more like um it's more like uh, yeah like um a test bed or a yeah, reference experimentation platform. ground for you to try things out. That's right. That's right. Yeah. And then later on, you have also added an uh, electric harp to your um, collection there, and you start playing it. I've seen some video of you playing it with a looper and your flute, and you're doing some live streams that as the ambient harp, I think it's how you called it. And how yeah. do you get into that? And when do you start incorporating the looper and the electronics into your music? Um, it was a longer process actually. I, I started um, playing around with loopers, yeah, just around ten years ago, maybe. And then, um, and and then, uh, basically, as just just as you try out a looper, you want to know everybody's doing it, and or some people are very cool with with that. There's a guy on YouTube called Rico Rico Loop, and I I don't think that's his. his Real name, but but it's it's like something that that he that he did, and he he was he was a uh, uh, really showcased by by the manufacturers of these um, devices, and uh, he was very good at it, and he did all this this uh, and, and looping away and and uh, impressing a lot of people at at uh, trade shows mostly, and and as a street musician, 
Um, so, so that's how I started with the looper. And I, I, I thought, okay, this is a very nice thing. It, it adds, um, it adds, yeah, obviously it adds layers. So you, you, you explore this, this, uh, this other dimension. And also to be very honest with you, I'm a bit of a lazy bastard. So whatever I loop, I don't have to play. And it's, it's great for practicing. It's great for timing. It's a great practice tool. And also it's, it's great on stage when you play more than one in instrument or more than one sound color of the same instrument. So it's, it's, it's a very nice, a bit of a very nice way to, to have this, you know, musical layer cake. And I greatly enjoy that. Um, back to your question and some, something like, a. uh, I want to, I, I, I tend to digress. I'm very sorry about that. But okay. uh, to answer your question about the ambient harp uh, or the the electric harp, that is the latest addition to my to my little um, pack of harps here. And I I, I got that uh, one and a half years ago, just before the lockdown, basically. And um, and I picked that up in in a, in, a, in a shop in Berlin. Uh, run by Kamak Harps, and they also made make these um, these electric harps. Very little digression, if you allow me, uh, of because that harp, that type of electric harp, was was pioneered and developed by Deborah Hanson Conant. Uh, yes, I recognize the harp. very iconic shape. This is, yeah, she uses exactly, and, and she yeah. she used to have this this uh, huge, very heavy electric harp strapped. Uh, onto her body and 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 when when no i mean she she's not she's not the most athletic person in the world she's very well um she looks a bit fragile maybe or she at least she used to but she was all, always very very strong and very like you know this 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 very um strength strength that you have naturally probably um and and but she, she has this huge harp uh and and it was very impressive and from there she helped Kamak develop in, uh, the next generation of it which was made um using carbon fiber and therefore a lot lighter than the old wooden frame so so that that's the the latest generation and the name for the harp i'm not getting paid for saying this i'm just you know passing on the information uh, it's 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 called the the type of the model is called dhc right and then followed by a number it's either 32 or 36 Six, I think, yeah, I think for is. the number of strings and dhc of course stands for deborah hansen conan so that's yeah. the that's the link there so so deborah if you if you're watching this um I'm very honored to to be part of this development. Yeah, it's such a, a great story. I have uh, watched her TEDx talk on how she helped Tarmac came up with the harp. And it was actually one of my earlier encounters with the harp. Like, I, I always know that pedal harp belongs to an orchestra. That's kind of the stereotypical image of how a lot of us came across the harp. But I've seen um, Laura Samoji playing on the Carmack Electroacoustic Harp, the Brick Brew. She played one of those and then DHC herself played the, the electric yeah, harp. Yeah. And I was like, that is cool. I want to do that with the harp. I don't like classical music. I don't need to be in an orchestra, but I want to do that other stuff. So that's really nice. Mm -hmm. And that's what I see in your live stream too, is you're really exploring the harp in a very different way than perhaps how you know your Celtic music would come across and whatnot. Yeah. Where do you get the inspiration to create the Indian harp project? Very interesting question. I think um, one reason is that I I didn't get bored with the with the Celtic harp. I mean, this is like the one instrument that would that I would take onto an island or, or something like that. And it's, it's, it's really like the, the center of, of everything that I do uh, musically, um, and and all the rest is complementary. That's the decision that I made. It's, this is my main instrument, and and it's, there's a good reason for that. But the inspiration is partly getting bored with doing everything you know with, with doing the same thing all over and over again i think that's that's one reason why i started to explore new things and and also because this music has a very different effect on people uh, including myself ambient music as a as a genre is you know it's often used in in meditations in in, in like background music for I don't know, a spa and or, or like wellness places 
uh, mindfulness meditation oh, i've already said that but uh, it's, it's like that's that sort of music and it, it really has an effect because it's very very slow it's a straight opposite of of this very hectic kind of irish um fiddly diddly kind of style and it's a straight opposite of that and, and so i wanted to get into that and uh, the on the electric harp you can make some sounds that you cannot uh, create with this instrument or you you can but it's it's slightly different and uh, and therefore I, I picked that one to you know to really go the whole way to its full extent it, it worked really well because I, I was actually just telling um, Javier that I can't put on your ambient music and work because I will just go to sleep because it's that calming. <laughs> I have to yeah. put on something a little bit noisier in order to, yeah. to stay awake. Um, I had a concert the other day, um, one of the few concerts that are, that are happening um, because we are probably facing um, another phase of, of restrictions as uh, COVID-19 is still not over and, and so, so over the summer we had a, a bit of a breather and um, I, I picked uh, or I had the, the opportunity to play some concerts and, and one festival. Um, so take take what you can get before they close everything down again. Definitely. That sort of spirit. And um, there was one concert on a small harp festival in, in Germany. It's called the Harp Summer or the Harp and Sommer. And the last one had to be cancelled and this one actually happened. So, so I, I played my, my ambient program there and it was very interesting because after all the live streaming, after playing one live stream after the other and, and uh, never getting the same feedback from, from people, playing it live was a very nice experience and I, I, had, I had the feeling that it really calms people down. It really, uh, it, it helps them to just let go of of the everyday things that we have to deal with and really really come to their um yeah to their center or to to their inner core or whatever you want to call it so so the, and and i don't want to make it a vehicle for for that i don't want to you know put a put a label on the music and and dedicate it to a like a single purpose and the harp is only the vehicle for that i wouldn't really um, want to do that i still want to leave place uh, I, leave, uh, I want to leave it to the audience to decide what the music is doing with them but with the ambient music is it's quite real and and quite um i wouldn't say predictable but it's uh, there is a certain effect really to this very slow developing meandering kind of music yeah and i think it's uh Probably a, a, something that we can all use. I remember talking to Marion Gruby, who is a sound therapist and she studied heart therapy. And we were chatting about how perhaps music and sound therapy is going to become more needed after COVID because we sort of have this collective drama that we suffer from, you know, being isolated and, and being in lockdown and whatnot. And I think having some soothing music is uh, is not necessarily going to hurt us because it's I think it's very calming and grounding. And Absolutely. how often are you doing these uh, live stream? Are you still streaming them? Um, yeah, not at the moment. I, I the last one was uh, already I don't know like three months ago maybe. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm still I still have some some programs on the on the Celtic harp and on my little Gothic harp that I want to play. Uh, it's it's one program entirely uh, dedicated to the music of Brittany which is also the, the theme of my last album. And one program with ancient music or uh, medieval music and or, or some, some Renaissance music and that I, I also want to present. So I have this like, you know, on hold live streams that I want to do um, before I uh, go further with the, with the ambient uh, harp again. It's, it's, it's difficult because if you do more than one thing, you have to make decisions and and you know focus on on what's important what is really important to you i probably won't play the ambient style for the rest of my life and and um, and um unless i get really famous with it but i really wouldn't <laughs> make that assumption and yeah. so I, I just jump from from one place to the other because um yeah maybe because i get bored easily or maybe because i don't want to lose touch with the with the other styles. Yeah. 
and we can still watch video clips of the live stream on your YouTube channel. So if you want, ever want to listen to that, and if you decide not to play it, exactly. you can always watch that. Yeah, <laughs> that's the that's the beauty of it. And yeah. um, and I don't know, maybe we can can put a link somewhere. Yes, I will definitely uh, to do the that. to the YouTube channel. It's it's simply called Hafenspieler. So that's the German word for harp player, and um, and uh, for for the English speaking world, it's probably best to spell that out somehow. Uh, yes, I will add it yeah. into the the video for yeah. sure. Now right. I have also learned that you do recording for like audio recording, and you actually recorded Babette's object, um, if I read it correctly in the description. I did, yes. Yeah, yes, is I, that a natural extension to what you're doing already with music, um, getting into audio recording? Probably, yeah. yeah. It, it's, it's, um, it was born of, out of necessity, really, because uh, when, I, when I recorded my first uh, harp CD back in 1996, I'm really getting old here. <laughs> um, <laughs> When I did that, I, I I was a student with uh, with no budget whatsoever. So I, I had to improvise, and uh, not just with music, but also with the with the budget or the lack of it. So I I borrowed some equipment and I recorded my own CD, and somehow it worked out pretty well. So I thought, okay, I recorded this this second one uh, again. That was my second sound engineering project, if you want, doing doing it for my own music, and then. Um, before that, I had, you know, read up on the th on the theory a little bit, and uh, tried out different techniques and different microphones, and I was in a better budget position at that time. So um, yeah, that's how that's how it started, and and then people started asking me, you know, like I don't want to have all the hassle with all the cable stuff and all the tech stuff. So can you do that for me? And I was like, well, we'll do that. And before you know it, you're a sound engineer. That's awesome. Now, without all the fancy equipment, if we're just, you know, like me, an average user, we just want to make a little video for a harp. Most of us has find that it's quite tricky to get a good sound in a recording. Is, is there any truth to that or are we just doing it all wrong? No, there's no shortcut, I'm afraid. No. Okay. Um, there's no shortcut. Um, you get uh, surprisingly far with just a smartphone and if it's it's if it one if it's one of the recent ones and let's say maybe made in the last three or four years um any kind of middle class iphone or smartphone or android phone or what have you um any of them will do and give you a very good start if you place it correctly if you if you don't Put it directly on the harp, but not too far away, maybe like half a meter or two feet away from the harp, and and that's uh, that's going to give you a an okay sound to start with, and you can stream your own concert. Uh, please, for the love of the fairies, uh, do it horizontally. Oh yes, <laughs> that's the only request I have. Um, but uh, other than that, you get pretty far with that. And the problem is the next step to, to a better quality is going to cost you a little bit. So you probably have to add a microphone to your smartphone, like a dedicated one. There are some manufacturers, very um, traditional manufacturers that used to do all these reel-to-reel -reel tape machines in, in back in the day. And they also make little microphones that you can just you know clip onto your smartphone. Um, like Shure is one manufacturer, or Tascam. Um, those are the like the, the traditional ones. There are many others, of course. And um, that's the second step. You know, adding like a dedicated microphone, and, and uh, instead of using the the teeny tiny ones that are in your smartphone. And the next step would be to maybe work, maybe record the files properly into a little digital audio workstation, which is a big word really for recording app. Um, if you have one like like a voice memo thing, make sure you you cross the little checkbox with the quality setting so that not everything is compressed to oblivion. And there you go. You can, you know, just basically have one step at a time and yeah, right move, move on. Yeah. Okay. There's a lot to learn there, but it's it's really a fun thing to do, and and um, 
it's not expensive. That's what I'm saying. You don't need like a big budget and, and hugely expensive microphones. Um, I needed them eventually because I, I wanted a certain quality, but it's not something that I had to start with. The, my starting budget, well, like I said, it was basically zero. I, I, I rented some, some stuff and I recorded for some nights and that was it. Okay. I also learned that you did the camera work for Babette's video. And I have discovered that you're a photographer. I found some adorable, adorable squirrel pictures <laughs> in your <laughs> <laughs> website. Now, yeah. for for old times sake here, I haven't fresh these in a long time, but I thought you would appreciate this. Oh, nice. Delta and, 100. Yeah, yes. and I, I am not a real, uh, sorry, I'm not a Velvia user, but I am a Riala lover. And then of course, Nice. Some good old slide. I have not used a film camera in a very long time, but I'm very interested in chatting to you about your photography work and how perhaps that sort of complements your other artistic endeavors and your musical endeavors. Um, do you start photography quite young as well? Is that has that always been part of your art life? Yeah, probably not. I started maybe when I was. 15 16 something like that and i um i there was something i wanted to express something with it's 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 a different i'm trying to like beam myself back in time in, in 1985 when i was 15 and and uh, and the cold war was still going on and all these things that you younger people only faintly remember <laughs> 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 back in the day um so i think i, I just had this impulse um that i wanted to express something in a visual way and i was very very bad at drawing and 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 you know like scribbling and and or, or uh, all these all these art stuff uh, that like visual art and, and painting and and drawing i was never good at that so uh, Photography was probably uh, the natural choice then because you don't have to paint everything. You just that is correct. <laughs> try to expose properly. Yeah, yeah. So, so that's that. And, um, and then, um, then there was a lot of analog photography. I just scanned all my, my archive last winter. There was a, a ton of work to scan all the old slides and the negatives. And then um, there was like the transition between um, analog and digital. Uh, around the uh, around the year 2000 and then uh, after that I, I started with with digital photography and then i um went back to analog photography maybe like four or five years ago and i explored that again because one impulse was that back in the day in the 80s i couldn't afford any other camera than the small one that i had the 35 millimeter and it certainly wasn't the best one and um, I, I remember like you know spooling up 35 millimeter film from a five meter roll because it was just cheaper and i could work and experiment um so yeah so whatever other people did at night under their blanket i was spooling up film <laughs> <laughs> good times i remember doing that and also yeah. putting in uh like medium format film in the back i remember putting a, a black bag over myself oh yes <laughs> yeah yes yeah. so, so you, you were you were one step uh, or many steps uh, ahead of me because i never i never worked with with medium format in, back in the day because it was just too expensive i couldn't i I learned it through a class. I think that was really yeah. the only way I have access to it. And I, yeah. I did a, also did a class on the large format camera that do the teal shifting. And I remember having to lug that whole <laughs> camera with me to go to a, a library in downtown Vancouver that has a lot of curve lines and, and trying to take a good shot of it. But uh, I, I remember the transition from film to digital being very painful. And I, I have these film with me. I'm not sure if, I, if I'm ready to go backward now that I've put all the work in, but I think you might have convinced me that it's worth giving a film a try again. You know, yeah, it is. Different. It's a different, um, the, the, the funny thing is, of course, it's, it's mostly psychological, but uh, I take different pictures when I work with analog uh, as opposed to digital. And also I even take different photos with my smartphone as opposed to a digital camera. 
it's, it's a d different way of looking at things and and uh, and deciding this moment when you when you press the shutter button and so yeah so that's i don't know it's always it's a, it's a different view a different angle so so why not have both yeah and i i see that in your harp as well because you're using the, each types of harp for a very different purpose and you're picking and choosing what you're doing yeah, yeah exactly yeah. yeah so there's a certain parallel yeah but to, to answer your, your question from from about eight minutes ago i <laughs> <laughs> like I said, I, I love digressing. You have to stop me. No problem. Um, I love listening to stories. So, so um, the video with Babette, we, we did that last um, autumn in November, I, I believe. And the camera stuff was, was uh, all like doing videos. Of course, that's where these different worlds maybe come together. Like the photography and the sound recording and playing the harp. You know, mm -hmm. it's all wrapped, wrapped into one, into a possibly nice harp video. And, and uh, Babette uh, contacted me because she had seen one of my own videos and she wanted to do something, something similar. And little did she know when she arrived that it was meant to be very unsimilar to what I have done I, because I, I liked her music. I, I liked her as a person and I thought, okay, we do something entirely differently and look, there are all these oak leaves outside and and, uh, and we, we just um, we just uh, collected them in a big basket and, and threw them in front of my little oven that I have here to keep warm and then we placed everything there and we had this harp scene and she, and before she knew it, she was, you know, in the middle of this scene and and the funny thing is that, um, or the, the point that I'm trying to make is that we didn't plan for any of that. It was all in the moment, take what you have, work with what you have, and make something nice out of it. I thought it turned out really well. I, I, I thought it was planned because of the, the leaves and the, the, the theme Nothing was the, planned. <laughs> the I swear to God, nothing. <laughs> and, and, uh, and also, my neighbor, he loves his leaf blower. He's a big fan of, of the leaf blower, and he has, and he got himself the loudest one that is in, that was ever made. It's probably, it's probably been illegal for the past ten years, um, and he, he he loves blowing his leaves with with that. And I thought, okay, why don't we add some movement and and call him over, and and then the camera was pointed towards uh, Babette, and there was a heap of of oak leaves on one side, and the leaf blower just blew them in, in her general direction and and then of course the trick was to uh, to use uh, slow motion we we filmed that with i think uh, 120 frames per second so that you can see these leaves really passing by in a like like in a time diluted way and we we wanted to 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 add that then to the video because it's yeah it was it was just a different touch really but what i'm saying is all the ideas that we have we didn't have a script we had the music and i didn't really know who she was and i thought okay i just try to be the channel for for every, or the conduit for for what's going to happen here and yeah that's for me that's that's a nice way to again like you said um creative expression yeah, and it's it's a very mesmerizing video to watch. Actually, I, I really enjoy seeing the leaf going across her face. Yeah, uh, it's and it's a lovely beautiful. piece of music. It's it's very it like I think it will it will even you know stand the test of time, and and people will ask for the score and and, yeah. and keep playing that. It's it's a lovely tune. It is a lovely tune. Now you teach um, in workshops, and uh, I think you do workshops on improvisations and jazz. Um, for those who are like myself, like I stick with the sheet music for the most part, if we want to get started on improvisation, what are some of your thoughts? Like, how do we stop looking at a piece of paper and play exactly what's on there? What are some of your tips to get over that mental barrier? Mm. Beyond, you know, looking at the fishbowl, I remember you said that. <laughs> yes, that's one thing. That's that's maybe maybe like for the that's for the second lesson. Maybe the first lesson yeah. would be to, it's it's a very very zen kind of thinking behind it because uh, you have to empty yourself, and you you have to start from scratch and you know just um, try to. 
it's it's difficult not to it's difficult to not think it's difficult to to just you know let yourself be for a second and 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 dwell in this stream of existence or whatever you want to call it this this flow i think that's a bit overused but um, let's do, let's call it flow hunter ray that sort of thing and uh, everything is in a flow and and once you're there um the the i think the the second part would be starting from this void mm, the second part would be to to apply a set of filters if you want to to say okay i'm i don't i don't want to have 12 tones per per, per octave i only want seven that's easy on the harp because you only ever have seven on this type of Celtic harp, and then um, so diatonic. Okay, that's 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 pretty good. Um, and then you limit yourself maybe to one scale, and you start with let's say the the Dorian scale, which I believe is very universal. So let me just um, play one drone, one little note here that repeats, and then you start exploring this scale. And you just play one note after the other. And then you notice they are in a tension or in a, in a relationship to each other. There is tension maybe, or maybe there is harmonic, um, harmonic, um, um, what's called the uh, the harmonic familiarity if you want there is a, a more a more academic term for that um the to tonal relationship really as in as in relationship between humans so one some of them are closer than others the octave obviously is closer than the the second and and, and you you just start exploring and you you see that um certain intervals have certain uh, they they do something with you you like them you don't like them or they are very harmonic or they are very disharmonic but but you always have some some sort of impression and and then you start exploring that and and uh, refining it and maybe applying different filters maybe say okay this is a rhythm that you, that I want to apply it's like this this drone or this uh, this you know clock beat heartbeat kind of thing that gives you a, like a bass that everything and everything is connected to that bass um so so everything that you play uh, with the with the melody hand it doesn't have to be the right hand but most more often than not it is everything there has a relationship with the with the drone and then you can you know focus on one scale and then the next day you focus on another scale and then once you have explored the the, the seven natural scales or traditional scales then you can maybe relax for a bit and you know that for the harp when you disengage all the levers and on the celtic harp uh, you put in the g lever and the D lever, so it's always D and G, and then you end up with a pentatonic scale, with two strings in each octave uh, repeating. Oops, <laughs> wrong, wrong lever there. So um, the, the point being, you can reduce these seven strings per octave even further to have only five tones per octave and it's still seven strings but but two of them have the same um note or the same um, frequency and there you go and you can knock yourself out and and that's that's one that's one thing uh, that i do with even my beginners classes even with classes that are not dedicated to improvisation and what i do is i tell people to you know just just play something and and sometimes when we when we are in a group um everything except the soloist it's like a in a jazz band every, every everybody except the soloist will play um some sort of accompaniment which of course we have to agree upon, like a rhythm and a 
maybe a one chord or two chords that are repeating something like that and then there's one soloist who plays along with that and and they don't have to concentrate on anything else they just have to you know focus on something melodious and something that they like and that's the first step into that big realm of improvised music yeah, i'll have to give that a try maybe in the weekend when i can empty myself and enjoy the void <laughs> yeah i yeah. think my, my brain sometimes is a little too busy <laughs> for that yeah but what, i mean it, it doesn't have it's not a strict requirement it doesn't have to be totally empty um but <laughs> partially, you know, just, partially. Just letting letting go of the of the um like you know like what do i have to what what are my upcoming household chores that i have to and oh my god the washing machine is finished and i have to you know that sort of thought you should let go of and and um yeah that's i'm saying that because i still have some stuff in the washing machine <laughs> i'm pretty sure i do too <laughs> <laughs> we'll check it after the conversation. Yeah. yeah. So, but, but that's, you know, that's the, the basic approach. Yeah. I hope well, that answers your question. Yes, it does. I'll, I'll give that a try and I'll let you know how it goes. <laughs> what are our best ways to stay in touch with your um, upcoming work or perhaps workshop or festival that you're playing in, program that you're playing? Um, yeah, it's it's probably easiest to go to the YouTube channel that and, and and I don't do announcements there. I don't do this YouTube news feed because I had I have enough news feeds uh, to worry about. And the other one would be probably Facebook. Um, there is you don't have to be registered to uh, Facebook to view uh, my Harpist page. There's one page called uh, Ralph Lehman Harpist, and then you just go there and see. The upcoming stuff it's uh, it's a little neglected uh, recently because i just didn't do much because of the coronavirus virus, uh, restrictions but um i'm sure then there'll be more again there's one yeah. concert coming up in october i hope that's going to happen fingers crossed fingers crossed fingers i think crossed, yeah. i think Babette is traveling quite a bit right now i think everyone's trying to take advantage of uh, yeah. what we have and, and enjoy it as much as possible yeah, yeah yeah take what you can get exactly <laughs> so i hope your october concert is gonna go as planned and uh, i'd love to uh come to one of your concerts hopefully in person one day but that's always something i think it's going to be very different than listening to your music through you know like yeah 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 and and hopefully hopefully there will be times when when we can we can travel again and uh, uh I've, I've been to canada long long time ago uh, as part of a um kind of a guided tour guided trip um that was 31 years ago and or 30 i think it was 30 years ago but it, it, it's an eternity and and i've never been to vancouver that would be one reason um you know and um yeah whatever my my path leads me to to that lovely country yeah. well thank you very much for chatting with me about all the different creative things you do including the harp and also photography and thanks for indulging me and recognizing <laughs> this good old little <laughs> tube that uh, i've been yeah, sitting yeah, in my I fridge did, for a long to, time <laughs> i didn't want to get too much into geek talk here and but 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 the, the delta 100 is one of my favorites it has a um a very um it's very malleable uh yeah. in post-production whether you do it analog or, or digital but it's 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 really a very um flexible malleable kind of uh film so you, yeah. you're gonna love that one yeah it is my favorite black and white film i think yeah. this is the one i keep going back to so and it's, it's very easy it's it's like if you develop it yourself it's there's practically nothing you can do wrong yeah Except pretty much mixing up the liquids maybe but uh... <laughs> and i quite enjoy doing darkroom work like i don't like uh, mm. color darkroom but black and white darkroom has always been something yeah yeah that's that's that's, that's 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 where i would probably stop as well because yeah. color darkroom is a mess it's, it's it very messy mess. and you have to i keep my, my black and white chemicals in a special container that i then you know bring, bring to the recycling center and and they uh, and, but but that would be like times three or times four if I, if I was doing color work and it's yeah. a very messy thing you have to get the temperatures absolutely right don't go there yeah no never <laughs> <laughs> yeah. black and white is much easier 
It is. And, and I, there's something about um, black and white that I think it challenged me differently. You almost have to plan way ahead about what, how that photo is going to come. And I enjoy that challenge. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, and, and also taking the photo starts a long time before you take the photo. I think that's that's the that's the basic gist of it. There's this wonderful meme, uh, one of these funny funny internet pictures that show like Neil Armstrong on the moon with his Hasselblad medium format six by six, and and uh, next to him is a, is a lady that that just uh, just went to to uh, fix her makeup or something, and then. Below Neil Armstrong, it says, went to the moon, took nine pictures. <laughs> and below the lady, it says, went to the bathroom, took 38 pictures. <laughs> okay, I'm going to have to look that up. It sounds hilarious. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's 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 one of the things, but but it it really illustrates, and and there's nothing wrong with either. It's it's, it's nothing wrong with going to the moon in any case, and then, um, and then I think that the gist of it is that there are different situations for for the for the application, and I'm sure that if they had digital cameras back in the day, they would have used them, you know, yeah. and uh, and still the photos turned out very very nicely. You can you can watch them on the NASA page for free and. Um, that's you know that's that's medium format for you yes it is and yes i'm gonna yeah. have to make a point in trying very different things on my different harps too because much like you like i yes i, I believe that, every harp is different absolutely and maybe that's that's the common ground uh, because we we like digressed into photography but i think it's it's artistically like what's going on in your in the creative part of your head that's the same thing really you you uh, try different things and and each process and each or, or each each instrument if you want or each camera um will will dictate a certain approach and and will will have certain limitations and and it, it really leads to a different approach to how you how you um work and it, it definitely the tool always influences the outcome i think yeah and I, I definitely see you as, um, in, in, in all the best way, a, a, a generalist instead of a specialist that just hone into one thing and keep doing the one thing. And I think there's a, a lot of merit to being a generalist and being diverse and being willing to experiment different things and different sounds and try it out. Because I think it, in many ways, open up um, your mind more as an artist instead of yeah it's, it's also like it's, it's it's that's that's absolutely right what what, what you say is, is absolutely right but it's also like five easy step how not to get famous <laughs> pretty much right <laughs> although I, I i i again like i think it's it's very interesting when you look at all your work in its totality and that's why i don't want to just talk about you know your work in the celtic heart even though that's kind of your focus but when you look at all the things that you do in the totality, I think it makes sense. It paints the pictures of who you are and yeah. how you approach music and art in general. So I, think I was uh, I was talking to my digital distribution guy, um, a lovely lovely uh, guy from, from France called um, Fabrice Fabrice uh, Abzil, um, and he he, he said, I, I talked to him a few months ago and before I was before I got buried buried in a wave of of other work. And then um, we talked about like how to differentiate your own musical persona or your musical identity. And I thought, yeah, maybe I can do two different or three different channels, and then it's better for Spotify because people are so specialized in picking their stuff. Or, and then I get rated in a better way, and and uh, they're another channel, they're not. But some someone has to manage all this stuff. And he basically said, you know you're a guy making music you're a person who makes music and and let the rest of the world put a label on it you know that's that's basically what what he replied or he said that you know don't don't worry about about that part too much yeah and, and i think i think it's it's i equally adore people who stick to one thing and get very specialized and very good at it that's it's also a, a, a marriage, but it's certainly not mine. Yeah, I think there's there's a place for for both. Like I, I'm I'm definitely grateful that there is someone who's specializing, for example, a special type of surgery, because <laughs> I probably don't want yeah. someone yeah. randomly just I doing mean, it, right? <laughs> so you know, you better be goddamn specialized for that. Exactly, but I think yeah. from a like being an artistic person kind of perspective, I certainly enjoy being able to put my hand into different things and and try 
Yeah. yeah, exactly. Exactly, yeah. Um, there's one more thing I wanted to say about specialization. Yes, there's one more thing. Uh, <laughs> the Hi. message for everybody who's, who's listening to my music, please steal whatever you want and, uh, you know, get inspired, make it better. Maybe then I'll steal it back. But but that's the gist, gist of it. I don't own any of this. I'm I'm. If anything, I'm a conduit. I, I like that uh, attitude and mentality. And again, I remember talking to Heather uh, about creativity. And there is a uh, American TV uh, persona, Mike Rowe. He is the host for Dirty Jobs. And in one of his talks, he talked about the fact that like innovation without imitation is a complete waste of time. So if someone has spent the time to create something new and no one is imitating it and making it accessible to other people, exactly. it's a waste yeah. of time. So I think yeah. what you said there exactly. captures that essence. If, if you yeah. created something and you get someone inspired to to learn it and make it their own, I think that's a wonderful idea. Yeah, I, I don't want to condone copyright violation in any way. <laughs> we'll that's, respect uh, copyright law while, while we, getting inspired. We respect copyright laws. And, and also, of course, I'm, I'm, I'm part of the, of the um, equivalent of RIA in, in Germany. And, and um, I have some registered pieces there. And uh, and so, so that's basically happening on on a different level. I don't. I mean, by by getting inspired, I don't mean that I take you know like uh, Jan Tiersen's music and say I compose this and this is my music. This would be very stupid and very uncreative, mm -hmm. and and also also that would probably get me for that. But uh, that's not what I mean. What I mean is get inspired by the by the essence of the music or by the by the um, what what's between the lines and and what what is what the music does with you what what is the effect and and what elements may be used to to create that kind of to span that bow and to, to that that arc and to um you know what's what's going on the language of the music please get inspired by that so that's that's basically what i'm saying yes and we're, we're going to go get inspired by you have your four albums and you have a lot of music in your YouTube channel. So we're going to go and yeah, listen feel free to, to explore. There's, <laughs> there's, there are many hours to, to, yes. to listen to while you while you do your chores or while you just listen to the music. It's up to you. Maybe not doing my chores, not with the ambient music, because I might <laughs> end up yeah, skipping the Yeah, you might, you might just, you know, yeah. decide to have a nap. I might get a little too relaxed. <laughs> and yeah. then the dishwasher will exactly. never get emptied. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. All these household things. Yes. Yeah. Thank you so much. I hope to talk to you again in the future. Really lovely getting to know you. Same on same on my side. It was it was a lovely lovely talk and and uh, very lovely to meet you too. Yes. Okay. And to 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 practice my very bad Chinese. Uh, xie xie. Xie xie. <laughs> Yeah, just as an addendum, because I, I forgot to say it earlier on, thank you so much, Victoria, to, for, for doing all this and, and uh, for um, giving us the opportunity to talk about our work and to present it. And um, thank you for your questions again. I'm very, uh, I feel very honored to be able to connect to different harpists. From, for me, I have always been interested in knowing about the person behind the work. Like I, once I have seen the work, I want to know about the person and what inspired them. And I think to go back to your point about getting inspired by, you know, the, the general art of how you do things. I think one of the better ways to get to know your thought process is to have an in-depth check like this. So I'm, I'm very thankful for the opportunity. Yeah, so am I. Thank you. Yeah.